May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus says, For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asks in the very next verse this echoing question, what is truth? What is truth indeed? As we celebrate Christ the King Sunday and we pledge allegiance to God's kingdom and not to the seduced kingdom of this world, as we commit to following this man, Jesus, who identifies himself, who claims his identity as way and truth and life, and promises that the truth will set us free. We find ourselves in an era when fact can be presented as opinion, when we wonder what is fake and what is true, and we hunger for good news. So it is that we ask along with Pilate, what is truth? I'd like to explore five dimensions of truth with you this morning. First, consider truth as honesty. This comes from the same Latin word as honor, and it means to be free of deceit, to tell what actually happened, to offer a reliable version of events, and we all depend on honesty. We need our friends and our families and our loved ones to tell us the truth. At work, we need to know what really happened. In our neighborhoods and in our government, we need this truth. We must be able to depend on each other. We can know the truth and we should tell it. Lying corrodes trust in every sense, like acid rain on limestone. We should not stand idly by when lies become normal because they are not right and lies must not become normal. But perhaps that's easier to say looking out at those other distant people in the church down the road or the government down the road than it is to look in the mirror. We all strive to be honest and we all fall short. We all miss the mark. And part of the good news of Jesus is that we can confess our sin of deceit. We can ask forgiveness and receive it. And God offers grace with no strings attached. And God calls us to amendment of life in a new way of being. But it must be said that honest answers are not always easy answers. In fact, they may bring consequences we wish to avoid, but no consequence is worse than living a lie. Second, think about truth as integrity. This comes from the same Latin root for entire, or integer, or integrated. And if you think about it, those words all point toward wholeness, like the number four, and not like the number 3.68759.23. Integrity means to have internal consistency, a lack of corruption. And in so in this sense, truth is a thing that we do. Integrity means to be dependable. It is a living out of our values and it leads to a sense of wholeness. Third, consider truth as accuracy, as precision. From the Latin root, this means done with care. And in some ways, this is the scientific pursuit of truth. Here, truth is a knowable thing. It is a number that exists if only we could measure it. So think concentration and mass and energy and population. And the scientific approach to truth seeks to be outside the moral realm. Scientists try to function as honest brokers. But even that quest is hard because some knowledge once known 
has enormous moral consequences. As we learned on Friday from the executive branch and over 13 federal agencies, climate change is wreaking havoc now and it's getting worse and the window to solve it is sliding shut. The world's poor take the brunt of the pain while the world's rich cause the bulk of the pollution. And what to do about this pressing moral question is actually a policy question. But it carries such moral weight, we've never asked it on this scale, which is global and will last for thousands of years. Yet we can know what is happening with accuracy and precision, and we should all be invested in having a clear picture of these facts which are not opinion. Because following Jesus means asking how to love neighbor as self in the real world, this one, where we live, right now. And fourth, consider truth as moral claim. Here the terrain gets tangled because good and faithful people will disagree. These are the thorny issues we really hoped wouldn't have come up on Thursday at lunch. Think Israel-Palestine, immigration, incarceration, and so many more. Issues where when we consider truth as a moral claim, we recognize that it becomes harder to name a single universal capital T truth. And depending on how you and I defined our priorities, how we weigh personal and public good, how you view justice and how I view compassion and how you view responsibility, we will draw different conclusions from each other, from the person sitting to your left. And if you look to your right, they're going to disagree too. And so this ambiguity about moral truth is both humbling and it's also deeply unsettling. In a sense, it could lead to a sense of gentleness in the public square because it helps us to see the good motives behind heated, differing opinions. But there's a danger too. And that is a false sense of moral equivalence. Is there such a thing as moral truth? If there is, how would we know it? And into these questions, we hear the voice of Jesus Christ the King offering a fifth and final view of truth, staring into the calculating eyes of Pilate who goes in and out of the headquarters and there's, all, there's seven scenes where Pilate questions Jesus in John's Gospel. This is the first one. And Pilate says, Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Will you not answer me? Are you a king? And Jesus claims his power and he names his kingdom. You say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And he is so clear that his kingdom is God's kingdom and it is not from this world. God's kingdom is not the seduced world, as Walter Brueggemann puts it, where it's you versus everyone else and where profit and self are king and you're fighting a zero-sum game with winners and losers, where it's your job to scramble to the top of the pile forgetting how many heads and hands you stand on to get there. No, God's kingdom is not of this world, not at all. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And he promises in John's gospel that the truth will set you free. But what is truth? What does Jesus mean by truth? That's what Pilate misses, what most of the world misses, and what might potentially pass us by, says scholar Caroline Lewis. And she goes on, Jesus' kingdom was never a place, but rather a perspective. It was never an established rule, but a promised reality of how to live our lives. Never a fought for hierarchy, but a forever hermeneutic, a way of interpreting the world. We are taught, she writes, to imagine kingdoms as nations 
rather than as a kind of reign, as territories rather than enfleshed commitments to love and liberty, as landlocked empires rather than a persistence in justice and freedom for literally everyone. After all, we know what happens when kingdoms are confronted for their wrongs, defied for their abuses, you end up like Jesus. When you stand up to the injustices of the kingdoms of this world that survive because of and thrive on fear, you can expect, you should expect, to be discredited and disregarded. The kingdoms of this world bank on sowing suspicion and authorizing autonomy. But this is not so with the truth and the way and the life that Jesus promises. For Jesus' kingdom chooses relationship and loving kindness. Jesus' kingdom chooses the perils and, yes, the predicaments of flesh. Jesus' kingdom tells the truth about the truth, which is that God so loved the world. Because Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and his way is truly defined by self-sacrificial love, we can say that God's truth boils down to this. That God so loves the world, so deeply and so profoundly and so forever, that we are called to respond. To love God. To love our neighbor and to change the world. I learned this story from Bishop Curry, and it makes the point about God's truth. As Albania was preparing to surrender to the Nazis in World War II, Muslim leaders of the country received a diplomatic cable from the Germans. And please hear the word Muslim. They were told to prepare a list of every Jew living in Albania, to provide names, addresses, phone numbers. And by this point, the Muslim leaders knew enough to presume that these Jews would die if they were handed over to the Nazis. And so the Albanian leadership refused to comply. They simply did not make the list. They put their lives at stake. And it, when it became clear that this was not going to hold and that more attacks were coming, they made a fake list and they sent that to the Nazis. And that very night, they reached out to the Muslim community in Albania and they said, you are to take your Jewish neighbors. Your food is to become their food. Your homes are to become their homes. Your children are to play with their children and you are to guard them with your lives. And all told, they saved nearly 2,000 people because of their pursuit of truth as they understood it from God. This is the truth of God's kingdom. For God so loved the world that we are called to respond in kind. And indeed, this is the truth which will set us free. Amen.